Well, thanks, Peter, and thanks to everyone for coming along to, to this event. It was sort of a no idea that, that we, the, the research team and Platypus, dreamt up together about 12 months ago, and it's great to see it actually come to fruition. Uh, basically, my presentation today is, is not going to get as, as granular into research projects as, as what we heard from uh, Professor Commenton Ford and, and the other presenters. I'm providing a much more general overview as to, to what the research grant is all about. Uh, giving a few snapshots into some of the findings of the research that's been done to date, uh, but more, I guess, uh, expressing my views and, and I know our views along with Platypus Asset Management as to some of the values of bringing together academia and, and uh, finance practitioners. So I guess the first question is, well, you know, what was this research grant all about? Uh, about 18 months ago, uh, Platypus Asset Management put out a, a call for expressions of interest uh, to the academic community for uh, looking for research partners to engage in, in academic research. Um, I know, having spoken to, to, to Peter himself and some Platypus people, they weren't exactly sure on, on, on what might come about from the project, and, and I think a lot of the, uh, the applicants put in, put in different proposals with, with different views, but I think the general consensus was that there's a really a, a need to achieve a dialogue between the academic community uh, and industry. This dialogue is something that, that happens quite substantially and quite extensively in the United States, but to date in the funds management industry, there's, there's not a whole lot of dialogue between academia and, uh, and the industry here in Australia. So the, the idea and, and basically what, uh, what our, uh, our research team is all about is that we're attempting to undertake some Australian focused research, uh, looking at areas of asset pricing and funds management, and as I said, with a really specific focus on the Australian market and really trying to pick up some of the unique features that maybe affect Australia and not other countries. Uh, in the process, and what, what I think uh, has, has come about as a residual of, of the, uh, the grant thus far, is that we've actually, it's been great for both parties, we've achieved this, this dialogue. Um, I have re regular communication, for example, with Peter, and I think we, we often bounce ideas off each other and uh, it helps to inform my teaching and research, and uh, I think it, uh, Peter's able to sort of bounce some ideas off us of, you know, what, what academics might think about certain issues and, uh, and certain research ideas. Now I think I mentioned earlier that, that in terms of uh, particularly finance from both the academic and the industry perspective, research historically has tended to be very US centric. Um, I'm sure both uh, academics and, and industry practitioners here today, if you're aware of research on areas you know, such as if I think of um, things like the value premium, um, the idea that, that over the long term, if you hold a passive portfolio, value outperforms growth. Well, people who have read research in that area, probably most people have read papers like Pharma and French, the US studies. Chances are very few people have read the Australian literature in the area. Okay? And, and, and to, to some extent, I think there's a bit of a dismissal of, of the Australian uh, literature, despite the fact that you know, Australia is a bit different from the United States. There are some unique characteristics and, and they have to be taken into consideration. So, as I said, really what we're trying to do is, is, is create this dialogue and, uh, and, and build a bit of a stronger nexus between academia and industry, uh, to some extent like what happens in the United States. So what I've taken here is a, a sort of a snapshot, I suppose, of some prominent examples from the US uh, and uh, instance where we see academic working very closely with, uh, with the funds management industry. So some examples, uh, probably the most prominent one, bottom right hand corner here, uh, Pharma French amongst others, uh, working with dimensional fund advisors in the US. Uh, their research in, uh, informs their investment processes. Uh, some others, AQR Capital Management in the US. Their, their research team is uh, very much academically driven. And I've got a picture up there of uh, Professor Moskowitz from University of Chicago, who's one of their academic researchers, part of their team. Uh, a few others, LSV Asset Management. Uh, the name LSV itself comes from Le Conishok, Schleifer and Vishni, who are three academics whose basic academic ideas uh, drive a lot of the investment philosophies of that fund. Uh, then I've got down the bottom here Burton Malkiel, uh, quite a prominent academic, author of the book uh, Random Walk Down Wall Street, uh, who's uh, heavily involved in some uh, China-focused funds, uh, including Baocap. So to give a bit of the background of, of what the research part of, uh, of our grant application was, was really all about and what we're seeking to achieve. Uh, I've mentioned already this, this US focus in, in research and, uh, and the attempt to, to, to really try to uh, look at things from an Australian perspective. Now, why is this interesting and why is it important that we don't just rely on the US results and I guess transplant them into the Australian context? 
Well, we all know that you know, Australia is a bit different from the United States. Uh, we've already heard from Professor Comment and Ford some of the market microstructure issues that might be different uh, from Australia compared to other countries. Some of the other issues might be things like illiquidity. Now, if you look at the feasible set of investments in the Australian market, in the Australian equity market, it's effectively only 300 stocks. Okay, outside the top 300, um, illiquidity comes a significant issue. And even in the, the bottom half of that top 300, uh, significantly uh, sized trades can really move the price quite substantially. Uh, in Australia, compared to other countries like the United States, we've also got differences with regards to concentration. Okay, so I think the top 10 stocks in the Australian market comprise something like 45% of the market. Uh, where that might have an influence, for example, is let's say you've got a portfolio that uh, you know, for whatever reason doesn't contain BHP in that portfolio. If you're benchmarking yourself against the market, then the performance uh, of your fund versus the market is effectively going to be driven by, well, what did BHP do last month? Okay, so some of those issues in terms of concentration uh, can have a significant effect. Where that also has effect is when we start to think about some uh, of the sort of um, asset pricing factors that we're going to be looking at in our research. Uh, because traditionally what we consider is we think, well, how do these various factors impact across different size groupings? So how, uh, how does something uh, like the value premium, how does it work in big stocks compared with small stocks? Well, this idea of concentration becomes an issue because how do we actually define what's big versus small in an Australian context? versus what we might do in a United States context. Okay, so just as a, as, a, as a quick example, I know it's one of uh, Professor Gray's hobby horses and he'll be talking in a moment. Uh, if you just transplanted the US research into Australia, uh, the way US academics define big and small is they split the market at the median. If you did that in Australia, the median size market capitalization is about $20 million. Okay, you can buy houses in Sydney for about $20 million. <laughs> So probably not a good idea to define that as a large cap stock. So these are sorts of issues that we have to think about. How, do, how does the Australian market work and what does the Australian market look like before blindly replicating US results or blindly transplanting those results? Obviously there's also some economic differences between the two countries. Okay, economic differences, uh, we can roll out the old journalist line of uh, correlation with, with Asian economies in Australia, uh, but also industry comp uh, comp uh, composition. Now interestingly, when we often talk about industry comp composition, uh, people will talk about the resource industry in Australia. But when it comes to equity markets, uh, in fact the Australian market, uh, industry composition is uh, more an issue in terms of our weighting towards financial stocks. Okay, financial stocks I think comprise about 40% of Australian market capitalisation, uh, a bit less but about 35%. Compared within the US it's about 20-25%. So again, industries tend to be uh, more concentrated in Australia as well. So in terms of the academic projects that we're undertaking and, and some of the, uh, sort of the, the more granular research issues that we're going to be looking at, I guess when you compare the US, results to, uh, US research to Australia, the, the key justification for why do we use US data is because in the United States there's these really rich data sets for price and accounting data. Okay, if you do uh, research in the, in the US, the, uh, the Chicago Research Database goes right back to 1927 okay, with price and accounting data. And historically, there's just nowhere near such a, such a rich, deep database in Australia. Okay, anyone who's done research for themselves will know that normally in Australia, the commercial databases only go back to about 1990. So there's not a huge scope to backtest uh, various strategies in the Australian market, uh, hence uh, one alternative route that's been taken is, well, let's effectively backtest in the US market by looking at US results. One of the key features of, of our research project, and I guess one of the, the key benefits that, that we find that we have, is that we've got access to a really deep, long time series of data. Uh, we're using data uh, from the Australian market from 1974 through to the present, uh, and we've got market cap and fundamental data uh, for all stocks back that period. Uh, we're fortunate enough to have piggybacked off the back of an Australian Research Council uh, grant whereby that data was, was collected and we're using that data to provide really meaningful analysis of the Australian market. Okay, to our argument, it's the very first time that, that in the Australian market meaningful research can actually take place. We know that when we look at things like asset pricing factors, so questions like uh, does momentum work or does value outperform growth, it's meaningless to look across a 10 year horizon. Okay, these things are time varying uh, and it could just be that you 
randomly select the sample where that particular ph phenomena worked or different, didn't work. And unfortunately to date, before the advent of this particular database, uh, any research that, that took place was forced to use that, that small time period. So the research was really meaningless. So in terms of using this database, we've got uh, five researchers within our research team uh, crossing three different institutions, University of Melbourne, Monash University and the University of Newcastle. And we're working together to really try to achieve two key goals. Uh, those two key goals is, well first of all, can we potentially identify new systematic factors? So uh, you know, new factors that might be considered in a, in a quant model of, of a fund. Uh, because we believe that we can use our long time series of database to, to justify that if there is some systematic factor that's identified, that that is a pervasive factor and not just a, a coincidence or a statistical anomaly associated with the time period we've examined. But also, and more particularly, and this emphasises our issue of Australia being different and the importance of not just relying on the US research, we're also looking at some uh, asset pricing anomalies or some factors that have been shown to explain returns in the United States and attempting to, to look at across our long time series of data, uh, do the same results stand up in Australia? Uh, and the presentation that we're going to see next by Professor Gray is going to report some interesting results of one of those particular factors, being the accruals anomaly, uh, where he demonstrates that, well, if you had just blindly replicated the US results, uh, might have led you up a bit of a dark alley. It doesn't seem to work as well in Australia as what we might expect. So our research is undertaking uh, five key questions, or there's five interrelated projects uh, that we're examining. Those five projects are the following. Uh, first of all, uh, as I mentioned before, Professor Gray is leading a project at looking at uh, the accruals anomaly in Australia. So accruals is considered a measure of earnings quality and looking at, at, at uh, the United States evidence that suggests that uh, stocks with high accruals tend to outperform those with low accruals and identifying, again, some, some differences in the Australian market, not only institutional, but differences in terms of things like accounting standards, and whether this particular anomaly is pervasive in the Australian market. Our uh, second project, which is one that I've been working on, uh, is looking at the idea of momentum in markets. So yeah, I think everyone in the audience knows what, what momentum means, the idea that winners tend to outperform losers. But looking at it slightly differently, looking at momentum in terms of portfolios as opposed to individual stocks. Uh, and specifically, and I'll talk about this project in a bit more detail, but looking at style level momentum. Okay, so can style portfolios uh, exhibit momentum and can you maybe use tactical asset allocation uh, across those styles uh, to take advantage of, of momentum. Third project. Uh, looking in specific detail of, of another uh, highly regarded anomaly, I, I think uh, it's commonly accepted that, you know, that the two premier anomalies, if you like, are momentum and value. But we're looking at a bit more detail about the value premium uh, because we know from both the United States and Australian research that over a long time period, passive value outperforms passive growth. Uh, but again, as I mentioned before, that US research stretches back to 1927. Now, there's very few, if any, fund managers that have an 80-year investment horizon and whose performance is assessed over an 80-year horizon. And what do we know about these factors is that they're time varying. Okay, so sure, over the long run, value outperforms growth, but, that, um, but we know also that there's periods where growth outperforms value, and we want to sort of dig a bit deeper and identify well, what are the characteristics of these periods where, where value does outperform? Uh, and again, is there some way that, that maybe could time the market? Uh, last two uh, issues here, we're, we're looking also at, uh, at another widely identified anomaly known as the idea of net stock issuances and uh, the, the idea that, that tends to be that stocks that have a high net stock issuance tend to subsequently underperform. Those with a low net stock issuance tend to overperform. Uh, theoretically, the argument is that well, maybe insiders in the firm are timing their issuance of equity. Uh, but looking again, is this phenomenon pervasive in the Australian environment? Uh, it's a particular in, in, interestingly it's a particularly interesting issue in Australia because of our tax system. So the imputation tax system creates different incentives to, to issue stocks, so it might affect the dynamics of the relationship between uh, net share issuance and returns. Uh, and finally, a, a project that uh, is probably what I consider to be the sexiest of the five projects, the most interesting one, uh, because it's a bit different from something that, that's been done uh, in, in previous uh, research. But what we're really focusing on closely is the idea of corporate governance. 
uh, and how corporate governance might affect uh, not so much returns in a broad brush type of approach, but how corporate governance might, for example, be able to be used as a screen to, to filter out particular stocks that maybe shouldn't be considered uh, within the, the, the feasible set of investments. Uh, we're, we're fortunate enough to leverage off uh, the work by Professor Jim Zaros, who's in our team, uh, who's the author of a, uh, a quite prominent report called the Hallworth Report over the last decade or so, uh, where he analysed the, uh, the corporate governance of uh, the largest firms in the Australian market. We're taking that database and extending it uh, and using it to have a look at uh, issues in equity markets. So time's, uh, time's of the essence today, so I'm not going to go into too much detail about each of the projects, but I just want to touch on some of the key results that, uh, that we've come across thus far. Uh, and just to give you a couple of take homes, a couple of issues to think about uh, in terms of asset pricing in the Australian market. So the first uh, paper I'm going to explore in some detail is this idea of style momentum. Okay, what is style momentum? Well, we know that investment styles are things like small cap, large cap, value, blend or growth. And uh, we also know that um, there's a, particular, a large amount of time dedicated by both researchers and practitioners to try to devise market timing strategies. So we're essentially getting the two ideas and, and bringing them together. Okay, is there a, a, an ability to use momentum strategies on the style level? Historically or traditionally, momentum strategies are employed at the individual stock level. Okay, I guess we're going to the next level, looking at momentum at the portfolio level. Now, this is, I guess, in some ways important because um, if you look at momentum strategies at the individual stock level, then momentum returns can largely be driven by idiosyncratic type of factors. So it could be that um, particular firms that, that um, and it could be a sort of a, a statistical anomaly, particular firms exhibiting autocorrelation that, that might bias your momentum results in the context of a research project. We're trying to eliminate the impact of idiosyncratic factors and look across these style portfolios whether there is evidence of momentum. So what do we do in, in this particular study? Well, I guess the, the tra traditional academic approach of um, creating style portfolios is to create 25 portfolios. So you cut the market up into 25 pieces um, based on uh, both size and value growth and create the portfolios in that manner. We've not only employed the sort of the traditional uh, academic approach, but also used a bit more of a, a, an industry sort of focused approach, uh, which again came across with some of my dialogue with Peter, uh, where we look at, well, how might the industry define uh, small and big cap stocks and, and value versus growth stocks? So we've actually got two different procedures to form our style momentum portfolios. Uh, one I'd say is very much the academic approach and one's been informed by industry. Interestingly, the results are pervasive across both. So it didn't seem to matter how we actually define style. Uh, the results uh, seem, to, seem to be quite strong. So just quickly looking at those, uh, those results, what, what do we tend to find? Well, what we tend to find is that momentum results at the style level do tend to be as strong as momentum results at the individual stock level. Okay, so just to, just to quickly identify what we're actually showing here. So we've got uh, the profit of a zero investment strategy. So, you know, a theoretical uh, portfolio where you're taking a long position in the winners and an equally sized short position in the losers. That zero investment strategy is earning a return of anywhere between one to about 0.4% per month. Now, obviously when, when, when you show results like this, 1% per month, it annualises to around 12%. It's starting to sound a little bit large. And you know, we'd acknowledge that you know, part of that, that excess abnormal return might be sort of statistical in that part of it mightn't be uh, economically implementable. But the strength and pervasiveness of these results and what we've looked at here is changing the period over which we assess our winners and losers. So we use a window of three, six and 12 months and the period over which we, uh, we hold and rebalance those portfolios, three, six, nine, and tw uh, 12 and 24 months. And the results really are pervasive, uh, regardless of, of what way we actually create those portfolios. So then the, the really key question I suppose is, well, it's pretty widely accepted that momentum strategies um, do tend to, to be there if you look at a long time series. So over a long time period, winners outperform losers. But I guess the key question, this becomes an important question for, for people to look, looking to implement these strategies, is what actually explains style momentum? 
And this is where we think that uh, we've, we've got a bit of a sort of an interesting difference with our paper and a, and a bit of a, I guess, a contribution is that we seek to explain the, uh, or decompose our style momentum returns into three possible explanations. Those three possible explanations are autocorrelation, okay, so continuation of returns, uh, variance, so this is the idea that, well, maybe uh, winners are just riskier than losers. Okay, in some ways, the, the variance argument uh, does hold a bit of weight theoretically, because uh, you would expect that uh, by definition, win winner portfolios across time, and when you aggregate all those winners, will have a higher unconditional mean compared to the loser portfolios. So statistically, it makes sense that part of the explanation might be risk-based. And the last one we look at is something called cross-serial correlation. And this is the idea that maybe there's lead-lag lead lag relationships in the market that explain these, these uh, style momentum returns. Now, interestingly, in the United States, uh, a lot of research that looks at momentum is, has actually explained momentum um, by, by being due to this idea of cross-serial correlation, the idea that maybe it's lead lags. We don't find evidence of that here. We find that, in fact, and this is a sort of a simplified graph just to show the, the various components, but the, the cross-serial correlation is effectively zero. Okay? It has no impact at all. Lead lag relationships don't affect momentum. What does tend to affect momentum is really um, the idea of here it is here, sorry, autocorrelation. So continuation of returns, and particularly across the, the, the shorter time periods of uh, three to six month holding periods, autocorrelation uh, is a significant driver of, um, of those momentum returns. And there is a component of returns that's also explained by risk. Okay, so we find that no matter which uh, strategy you, you employ, partly, part of momentum profits are because winners are riskier than losers. Now I'll move through uh, the last couple of slides quite quickly, but I just want to touch on the, the last few papers and some results we've got. I mentioned before exploring the, uh, the value premium over the market cycle, and this is all about the idea that um, while we can identify some factor that outperforms in a, in a sort of a passive sense over a long time horizon, we're trying to, to, to get a bit more granular and look at some of the time varying effects of the value premium. And what we find is uh, value tends to be countercyclical. Although noting this wasn't the case in the global financial crisis, which is a bit of an interesting anomaly, uh, while size and momentum tend to be pro-cyclical. Okay, so size and momentum do tend to perform a lot better when the market's going better. Uh, to move through uh, the last couple of research papers very briefly, the idea of net stock issuances and returns. So this is a work we've, we've been collecting and cleaning the database for about the last six months and we're just about ready to, to start pumping out some results. Um, I mentioned before that, that uh, there's a couple of US uh, research papers that look at this issue, but we're particularly interested in whether uh, there is a relationship between net stock issuances and returns in the Australian market, given the imputation tax system, which might create incentives for repurchases that aren't related to market timing at all. Okay, so maybe repurchases in Australia are driven for tax purposes uh, as opposed to, to, to some other incentives. And last of all, uh, very quickly before I finish up, this idea of the relationship between corporate governance and returns. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, Professor Saros was uh, the author of the Hallworth Corporate Governance Report where he rated the performance of um, the largest Australian stocks in, on a five star scale. And we're using and extending upon that database to ask a few academic questions. Okay, some of the questions we're gonna ask, well there is a study in the US that, that claims that um, Forming an investment uh, position based on corporate governance earns an abnormal return. To be honest, theoretically, I don't really uh, buy that, but we're going to test test that particular result in the Australian market. What we're a bit more interested in is, is issues like uh, looking at takeovers uh, and looking at maybe the, some of the agency arguments of takeovers and whether in a takeover, whether whether the uh, the takeover premium is greater or less if the target company and uh, the acquirer company have good or poor corporate governance scores. So it's uh, basically using that, that corporate governance metrics uh, to, to also maybe try to uh, identify riskier stocks in the market and you know, some names that, that, that should be avoided in a, in a portfolio sense. So in summary, I mean a 20 minute presentation, a bit of a crash course in terms of what we've been working on over the last 12 months and what we're gonna to continue to work on in the last couple, next few years. 
Um, but if I sum up, I think uh, in the introduction we heard about the, the, the size of the superannuation industry in Australia and the fact that this industry invests over a trillion dollars in dom domestic equity markets. Okay, given the, the magnitude of that industry, it is really important that we don't just transplant research results from the US into the Australian market. I think it's beneficial for both academics and for industry to, to have some dialogue. Now, I'm not for a moment saying that, that academics should advise portfolio managers in terms of exactly what strategies that they should take. Uh, we're just talking about an open dialogue between both parties. And the whole idea of this research grant has been, it's facilitated that dialogue, and we hope some, that the ongoing research can have some benefits uh, for the funds management industry. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Paul. Any quick questions for Paul?